Hotman, yeah. Dean of Students, Dr. McMaster, of course, the chairperson of SASCO, Stellan Boss, yeah. and fellow students. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to return to this important center of learning to reflect on what is obviously an important and relevant topic. In this invitation letter to me, the SRC, which wrote to me on behalf of SASCO, said that the Council had identified the sum of its goals to stimulate dialogue, to encourage critical thinking, and to reach for a more transformed campus. And I'd like to commend the SRC and the student body as a whole for setting those important goals. And I hope indeed that you have given yourselves time critically to assess the historic events in North Africa, to come to some conclusions about what they mean for Africa and the African students. But what can we say about these events, restricting ourselves for now to Egypt and Tunisia? We will return later to the case of Libya. With regard to everything we will say, Please remember that the youth constitute the overwhelming majority of the population in all the countries we are discussing. In Egypt, for instance, two-thirds of the population is under 30, while youth unemployment stands at least at 25%. And given the topic you have asked us to address, I hope you'll agree that necessarily we'll have to spend some time reflecting on the events in North Africa so that together we're better able to assess the potential role of the African students in this regard. And there is no doubt that what we saw in Egypt and Tunisia were genuinely popular and peaceful uprisings aimed at the democratic transformation of these two African countries, starting with the overthrow of the ruling groups. And accordingly, the uprisings aimed to achieve the fundamental transformation of their societies and not only their political systems. And it's also clear that in both instances, the youth and students exercised leadership by being the first to take to the streets and by persistence until the first objective of the uprising, the overthrow of the ruling groups was achieved. It is also important to understand that this objective was achieved because the people as a whole joined the youth and students, transforming the rebellion of the youth into a national uprising, which more or less guaranteed its success. And equally, we have to understand that what also facilitated the success was that the armed forces in both countries refused to suppress the uprising and therefore to protect the governments of the day. On their own, the police and other security organs could not defeat the uprisings, regardless of the amount of force that they used. It is also clear that the uprisings were an indigenous affair, carried out without any significant interference by foreign powers to help direct what were authentic African endeavors. It is also significant that the governments of both Tunisia and Egypt collapsed within a very short time after the start of the uprisings, marked in particular by the resignation of the heads of state, Zine El Abidin Ben Ali and Hosni Mubarak, uh, respectively. This could only mean that such was the degree of social rot over which these heads of state presided, and such was the isolation of their governments from the masses of the people that it would not take too much pressure to topple them, as actually happened. The April 6 movement was one of the most prominent of the youth and student formations which played a critical role in the Egyptian uprising, which incidentally named itself after a brutally suppressed workers' strike which had started on April 6, 2008. And in a statement this movement issued on the 6th of February this year, 2011, and reflecting the extent to which the Mubarak regime had lost the confidence of the people, it said we will complete what we started on the 25th of January. We, the Egyptian youth, will not be de deceived by Mubarak's talk, which aimed to manipulate the emotions of the Egyptian people and underestimated their intelligence, as he has become accustomed to doing for 30 years in speeches, false promises, and mock election programs that were never meant to be implemented. And they said Mubarak resorted to this misleading talk, thinking that the Egyptian people could be deceived yet again. And so they said that the youth and students and the people of Tunisia took exactly the same position with regard to their then president, Abidin Ben Ali. By the time he was forced to leave office, Ben Ali had served as president of Tunisia for just over 23 years. And Osim Mubarak had served in the same position for 29 years. Again, as all of you know, 
both of them held on to these positions through what were described as democratic elections. The reality, however, is that these elections were not democratic by any stretch of the imagination. And therefore, that both presidents and the groups they led clung to power depending not on the will of the people, but resort to other means which deliberately sought to frustrate the will of the people. And these were fraudulent elections and the maintenance of an extensive machinery of repression. And many in the Arab world claimed that Tunisia had the most repressive state machinery of all countries in the region, making it what is correctly described as a police state. And in addition to the monopolization of political power by a few, this meant that this tiny minority, as in Egypt, had every possibility to abuse its illegitimate power to enrich itself by corrupt means. In a January 28th article this year, the, the Washington Post US newspaper it reported that the Ben Ali and Trabelsi families, and uh, uh, Leila Trabelsi being uh, Ben Ali's wife, that these two families controlled a vast number of companies and real estate sometimes taken by force. Even distant relatives seemed to be above the law, and Tunisia was their personal treasure chest. And it is said that the Ben Ali and Trabelsi families controlled between 30 to 40 percent of the Tunisian economy. And one commentator, a professor, Juan Cole, said that the U.S. leaked cables from WikiLeaks suggest that 50 percent of the economic elite of Tunisia was related in one way or another to the president or to the first lady and her clan. We must expect that in time, credible information will also come out which will also demonstrate that the Mubarak family and its associates also accumulated a great deal of wealth by corrupt means. At the same time as the ruling groups in Egypt and Tunisia were enriching themselves, millions across among their people faced challenging socio-economic conditions characterized by high rates of poverty, of unemployment, and an unaffordable cost of living. This meant that not only were millions languishing in poverty, but also that the situation was made worse by declaring disparities in standards of living between the rich at the top and the poor at the bottom of the proverbial pyramid. But what about the students and the intelligentsia? In an article, uh, the head of students sparked Tunisian uprisings, uh, published on the 18th of January. Uh, one Tufik Bugada wrote that after four weeks of street protests in Tunisia, triggered by angry, unemployed university graduates, Tunisians have ousted President Zin Alabin Ben Ali, who ruled for nearly a quarter of a century. And he said the protest started on the 18th of December 2010, when Mohammed Bouazizi, an unemployed university graduate, working as a street vendor, committed self-immolation in protest after the police had confiscated his stock of fruit and vegetables. And this sent ripples through society with men academics decrying day-to-day -day life, which is rife with corruption, with unemployment, and hikes in food prices. And he reported that unemployment is even higher among the university graduates, with almost 25% of graduates failing to find work. And despite having a better education system than its North African neighbors, the high rate of graduate unemployment in Tunisia means many young people shun tertiary education." Unquote. As you know, and as we have uh, mentioned, the Tunisian uprising was sparked by the disturbing event when an, un an unemployed graduate who made a living by selling fruit and vegetables as a street hawker bent himself to death. In this context, we should also note that even in Egypt, the uprising was sparked by the death, in part, of yet another university graduate, Khaled Said, who was killed by the police in Alexandria. And early last month, in an article entitled Brains Unused, Rania Halaf of Al Ahram reported on a sit in by the university graduates at the Academy of Scientific Research in Cairo. And these were unemployed graduates who were demanding to be taken on as lecturers in Egyptian universities, with some of them, including people with PhDs, having been unemployed for seven years after they had graduated. So acute is a problem that Halaf's article concluded with the words that what is needed is an in-depth review of the problems 
facing higher education in Egyptian universities, and an ambitious plan to make use of Egypt's brain power. Again, if there are not enough job, job vacancies in Egyptian universities, it says it is high time for the government to find ways to benefit from this brilliant and highly promising manpower. And responding to this situation, a communique issued by the January 25th Youth Movement, which is of course the day that the uprising began in Egypt, it issued a, a communique which said that Egypt's youth went out on the 25th of January with a strength, courage, boldness, and heroism that had been unprecedented for the people of Egypt and completely unexpected. So that there would be no difference between the graduates of professional schools and those with lesser degrees to confront the unemployment that has destroyed the lives of Egyptian youth. So that 472 youth no longer drown weekly in the Mediterranean Sea. Their only crime being that they seek work and food to lessen the burden their families bear. So that we came out to protest the lines for even proper and gaze bottles and bread. And we came out to demand an education that allows us to complete to compete among the nations of the world, not an education that allows the world to mock us. We came out for the sake of the 52% of our people that are illiterate. We came out for the sake of national goals that unite all of us and allow us to dispense with idling our time in cafes. I hope what I've said so far is sufficient to indicate, among others, the principal objectives of the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt including issues relating to the students and the intelligentsia. And as I said earlier, it is clear that these uprisings had as their fundamental objective the victory of the democratic revolution in both countries. However, as the people who constituted the heart of the uprisings admit every day, the democratic revolutions have not as yet emerged victorious. It was therefore always a bit of a misnomer to describe the uprisings as revolutions. To indicate the challenges facing the democratic forces in Egypt concerning the fundamental changes for which they fought and are fighting, I'll present to you some observations made by some Egyptians uh, which comments would speak for themselves. What I will present to you henceforth will include relatively extensive quotations by various individuals and institutions. And I must confess that I chose to rely on these citations to avoid the accusation that I have sought only to convey my own partisan views. An article published at the beginning of this month, entitled Time to Get Serious, one Salama, a Salama of Egypt, says that the brief honeymoon that followed the 25th of January Revolution, when the army and the police were said to be one hand, has ended in mistrust and misunderstanding that the recent reshuffle of the Esham Sharaf government has failed to address. As it turned out, Sharaf is now catching flag from all sides, with people blaming him for slowing down the revolution, or failing to address security, of failing to speed up the trial of former officials. And he said, turning to the revolutionaries, we have to admit that there are still a motley crew of well-intentioned but disunited groups and alliances, hard to enumerate or to figure out. They have no leadership to negotiate on their behalf or a set of suggested policies to follow. But what this country needs right now is policies that take domestic as well as external considerations into account and we need a government that knows how to tend to economic and social demands while keeping at bay those powers, Arab and non-Arab, that do not wish to see democracy take root in Egypt. And towards the end of May, again this year, one Khalil El Anani wrote an article which said it's entitled Egyptian, the Egyptian Revolution Reconsidered. And he said although the Egyptian Revolution succeeded in ousting the Mubarak regime, it has not yet managed to uproot the ills of its culture, value system, and prevailing modes of behavior. In this sense, therefore, it remains half a revolution, or more precisely, a revolutionary act that still needs follow through towards completion. The heart or foundation of the Egyptian state remains unchanged, change at both levels, the political system and society is a prerequisite for the completion of any revolution. And he said, of course, there is no decrying that the Egyptian Revolutionary Act was sudden and very powerful. However, its major trust emanated from and remained largely restricted to a particular stratum of society, mainly the, the middle to upper middle class. It has yet to spread to other strata of society, which remain essentially the same as they were before the revolution. 
and he said that this phenomenon is not peculiar to Egypt, that other countries have experienced similar popular uprisings that succeeded in overturning regimes, but did not go so far as to engender radical change in the prevailing values, the culture, and the structures of society. And so the Egyptian revolution itself can therefore be described so far as a minimal revolution. It achieved the minimal level of the dream of the majority of the Egyptians, which was the overthrow of the old regime and the prosecution of its leaders and most prominent figures. However, it remains a considerable way off from the upper level, which involves the transformation of social and institutional structures and value and behavioral systems, so as to enable society to regain its health and proceed towards the realization of human development and prosperity. And he concluded by saying, not every outburst of collective anger and frustration is a revolution. Not every defiance and overthrow of an old regime and its legal edifice is proof of a successful revolutionary act. The sole guarantor of the success of a revolution is society itself. And herein lies the crux of the dilemma. The performer of the revolutionary act, that is the agent, needs a revolution so that the act and the agent can be brought into harmony and so that the results are consistent with the beginnings. And let me conclude these quotations with one from Fatma Kafagi, a women's rights activist and a board member of the Alliance for Arab Women, who said, wrote an article which was entitled Now for the Gender Revolution. And she said, I want to see the opposite of what has always happened after revolution take place now in Egypt. History tells us that women stand side by side with men, fight with men, get killed defending themselves and others along with men, and then nurse the wounded, lament the dead, chant and dance when the struggle is victorious, and help to manage the aftermath when it is not. However, history, history also indicates that after the success of the political struggle, women are too often forced to go back to their traditional gender roles and do not benefit from the harvest of revolution. And she said, I'm sure the Egyptian revolution will not allow this to happen. And the Egyptian revolution, as I witnessed every day and night, she said, in Tahrir Square, was not only about getting rid of a political system. It was also about creating another and more beautiful and just Egypt that would guarantee human rights for all its citizens. I saw young women discussing with young men what kind of life they wanted to achieve for Egypt. And I feel sure that the gender equality that was witnessed in Tahrir Square and elsewhere in Egypt will now prevail because we need it to create a better Egypt, unquote. And program director, I'm certain that the observations made by the three Egyptian commentators I've just quoted would apply in similar manner to Tunisia. Libya was and is of course a completely different kettle of fish. In this case, it is obvious that the major Western powers decided to intervene to advance their selfish interests using the instrumentality of the UN Security Council. Okay. I'm certain that many of us here will at least have heard of the independent non-governmental organization headquartered in Brussels, the International Crisis Group, the ICG, which focuses on conflict resolution. Its current president and CEO is a Canadian judge, Louis Arba, former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and former UN Chief Prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunals of the former Yugoslavia and, and Rwanda. I mention all of this to make the point that neither the ICG nor its president and CEO were or are or can just, justly be accused of being in any way sympathetic to the Libyan Gaddafi regime. And yet in a report on Libya issued on the 6th of June this year, the ICG says that much Western media coverage has, from the outset, presented a very one-sided view of the logic, logic of events, portraying the protest movement in Libya as entirely peaceful and suggesting and repeatedly suggesting that the Libyan regime security forces were unaccountably massacring unarmed demonstrations who presented no real security challenge. This version would appear to ignore evidence that the protest movement exhibited a violent aspect from very early on. Likewise, there are grounds for questioning the more sensational reports that the regime was using its air force to slaughter demonstrators, let alone engaging anything remotely warranting use of the term genocide. That said, the ICG says the repression was real enough 
and I would as an aside add, as was the case in Tunisia and Egypt, and they said this brutality shocked even Libyans. It may also have backfired, prompting a growing number of people to take to the streets. A similar observations had been made earlier by one Alan K. Cooperman, who wrote uh, in the Boston Globe, a US newspaper on the 14th of April, uh, under an article which was headed false pretense for war in Libya. And he said evidence is now in that President Barack Obama grossly exaggerated the humanitarian threat to justify military action in Libya. The president claimed that intervention was necessary to prevent the bloodshed in Benghazi, Libya's second largest city and last rebel stronghold. Obama insisted that prospects were grim without intervention. Thus, the president concluded that preventing genocide justified U.S. military action. But intervention, said Cooperman, did not prevent genocide because no such bloodbath was in the offing. To the contrary, by emboldening the rebellion, US, U.S. interference has prolonged Libya's civil war and the resultant suffering of innocents. And later in his own report, the ICG said that the prospect for Libya, as, but also North Africa as a whole, is increasingly ominous. Unless some way can be found to induce the two sides in the armed conflict to negotiate a compromise, allowing for an orderly transition to a post qaddafi post jamahiriya state that has legitimacy in the eyes of the people, Libyan people. A political breakthrough is by far the best way out of the costly situation created by the military impasse. And its ICG went on to say, instead of stubbornly maintaining the present policy and running the risk that its consequence will be dangerous chaos, the international community should act now to facilitate a negotiated end of the civil war and a new beginning for Libya's political life. To insist that ultimately Gaddafi can have no role in the post jamahiriya political order is one thing, and almost certainly reflects the opinion of the majority of Libyans as well as of the outside world. But to insist that he must go now as a precondition for any negotiation, including that of a ceasefire, is to render a ceasefire all but impossible, and so to maximize the prospect of continued armed conflict. And they concluded that to insist that he both leave the country and face trial in the International Criminal Court is virtually to ensure that he will stay in Libya to the bitter end and go down fighting, unquote. And bitter facts on the ground showing the loss of African lives and the destruction of property in Libya demonstrate that the ICG was absolutely correct. The naked reality is not that the Western powers did not hear what the ICG said. Rather, they heard but did not want to listen to anything informed by the objective to address the real interests of the African people of Libya. They were in a bent on regime change in Libya, regardless of the cost to this African country, intent to produce a political outcome which would serve their interests. And earlier this year, on uh, the 2nd of March, a senior journalist on the London uh, British newspaper, The Guardian, uh, Seamus Mill, wrote that the responsibility to protect invoked by those demanding intervention in Libya is applied so selectively that the word hypocrisy doesn't do it justice. And the idea is that states who are themselves responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands in illegal wars, occupations and interventions in the last decade, along with mass imprisonment without trial, torture and kidnapping, should be authorized by international institutions to prevent killings in other countries is simply pre pre preposterous. And he said the reality is that the Western powers which have backed authoritarian kleptocrats across the Middle East for decades now face a loss of power in the most strategically sensitive region of the world as a result of the Arab uprisings and the prospect of representative governments. They are evidently determined to appropriate the revolutionary process wherever possible, limiting it to cosmetic change that allows continued control of the region. And he said foreign military intervention wouldn't just be a threat to Libya and its people, but to the ownership of what has been until now an entirely organic, homegrown democratic movement across the region. He said the Arab revolution will be made by Arabs, or it won't be a revolution at all. And later on, by the same March, March uh, uh, this year, he wrote that as in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
With regard to Libya, the Western powers insist humanitarian motives are crucial. And as in both previous interventions, the media are paying for the blood of pantomime of a pantomime villain leader, while regime change is quickly starting to displace his state admission. Only a Western solipsism that regards it as normal to be routinely invading other people's countries in the name of human rights protects NATO governments from serious challenge. For the Western powers, knocked off balance by the revolutionary Arab tide, intervention in the Libyan conflict offers both the chance to put themselves on the right side of history and to secure their oil interests in a deeply uncertain environment. And Sean Milne's colleague in the same newspaper, Simon Jenkins, wrote only three days ago, on August the 23rd, that if British Prime Minister Cameron wants to take credit for the removal of Gaddafi, then he cannot avoid taking responsibility for the aftermath. Yet that responsibility strips a new regime of homegrown legitimacy and strength. And he says this is a classic paradox of liberal interventionism. And he said Britain remains enmeshed in the Muslim war, in the Muslim world. It made a mess of Iraq and is trapped in Afghanistan. It hardly needs another costly and embarrassing client state to look after in this surge of new imperial dogodari. We may applaud the chance of freedom about to be granted to a lucky group of oppressed people, but that doesn't justify the means by which it was achieved in another fury of great power aggression. And he said the truth is that Gaddafi's fall, like his earlier propping up, will have been Britain's doing. A new Lib Libyan regime will be less legitimate and less secure as a result. And in this regard, four days ago, only another senior correspondent on the same newspaper, Jonathan Steele, said thanks to the crucial role in tipping the military scales in Libya, NATO and rebels are inextricably linked. Gaddafi had few supporters in the Arab world, but there is a justified perception on the Arab streets that the rebels are over-reliant on Western support and that the overriding Western motive is access to Libya's oil. And they said the best revolutions are homegrown as they were in Tunisia and Egypt. And those who took to the streets in Tunis and Cairo and Tahrir Square wanted to regain their country's national dignity after decades of seeing their rulers doing the bidding of France and the United States. And they said the new rulers in, 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 in Libya face a long road ahead in establishing their legitimacy on the Arab and the African stage. And indeed they do. At the end of everything I've said, <coughs> relating to Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, what should the African students do, including you, the students here at Stellenbosch University? I'm certain that the totality of my comments will have confirmed the reality of which you are aware that recent and contemporary processes in North Africa were indeed truly complex. The first, first suggestion I would therefore like to convey to you is that in order for you to play a meaningful role in this regard, and indeed in the context of all, all other significant developments in Africa, you must make the effort to study and understand these developments. You have the unique advantage that you are students. As a former university student, I know that your principal task is to study. And if you do not do this, it surely would be incorrect to describe, to respect, and honor you as students. Further, as my second suggestion, I'd like to believe that you will seek to understand African reality not for the pleasure merely of knowing, but because you would want to do what you can to help to change our continent for the better. In this regard, you would, of course, be inspired by what your peers have done in Tunisia and Egypt, who took the lead in the popular uprisings in their countries, which indeed have served to advance the African democratic revolution. At the same time, I'm quite sure you will have been motivated by, to follow the heroic examples set by your own South African predecessors, such as those who participated in the 1976 Soweto uprisings and others of our students before and since. And quite correctly, you see yourselves as part of the greater family of the millions of students in Africa, determined to act together with your colleagues to reshape our continent into the kind of homeland you wish to inherit. In this context, and as my third suggestion, I'd like to propose that you make a determined effort to study various documents 
which constitute all Africa policy, by virtue of, being, of having been adopted by the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, and its successor, the African Union. In the context of the topic that Sasko asked me to address this afternoon, I would suggest that you give yourselves time to study and debate, among others, the Constitutive Act of the African Union, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, the Protocol of the, to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption, the Protocol Establishing the Peace and Security Council, the Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, the African Youth Charter, Charter on African Cultural Renaissance, documents relating with human resource development, science and technology, the NAPAD founding document and the African peer review mechanism. And I mentioned these particular documents, all of which have been adopted by all of the African governments because they address directly the many political, economic, security and social issues which have arisen in the context of the North African struggles we have, been con we have convened to discuss and which, if implemented, would have addressed the concerns of our North African brothers and sisters. As you study and debate these documents, and as my fourth proposal, I would suggest that you ask yourself and strive to answer two important questions, which are what should be done to position the African Union so that it has the ability to help ensure that all our member states actually respect the objectives defined in these documents. And secondly, what should the African student movement do to help achieve this outcome? The fifth suggestion I would like to make relates to what happened in Cote d'Ivoire and what is happening in Libya. Specifically in this regard, you should debate what Africa should do and what the African Africa students should contribute in this regard to defend and advance our right as Africans truly to determine our destiny as a sovereign people. I've been told that uh, some of the intellectuals at our universities reject the claim we make regularly to find African solutions to African problems. The only way I can explain this very strange posture is that these are Africans who have lost respect for and confidence in themselves as Africans. <laughs> and who therefore feel obliged to adopt positions which question ours and their right and capacity to solve our problems. Sadly, I've never come across any Europeans or Americans or Asians who would even so much as find it odd that they should have said that they have every right to find solutions to their problems. I'm also convinced, and as I said earlier, <clears throat> that the SRC here was correct to set as one of its tasks the achievement of what it called a more transformed campus. Well, as a member of the convocation of this university, as the rector has just said, I know that certainly under the leadership of the rector, Professor Russell Gottman, you have indeed been discussing what this means. Placed within the larger African context, context, this must surely mean that we strive to ensure that this university does its best not to produce the unused brains to which an Egyptian commentator referred, and that our country as well finds ways to benefit from the brilliant and highly promising human power of those who graduate from Stellenbosch University. Thus should you, the students, together with the rest of the university community, which is my sixth suggestion, continue to engage the critically important issue of how the university should persist in the effort to transform itself so that as an African center of learning, of teaching, of research, it also serves as a vital intellectual center for the progressive fundamental transformation of our continent and therefore its renaissance. I'm also very pleased that as students here at Stellenbosch, you see yourselves as having shared obligations towards our continent with the larger collective of other African students. As my seventh suggestion, therefore, I would like to suggest that through formations such as SASCO and indeed other societies and indeed through the SRC, you should do everything you can to strengthen your li links with your African peers, including and through the strengthened, the strengthened and more active and correctly focused all Africa Students' Union. The recent and current events in North Africa have confirmed that Africa students remain one of the most vital and courageous forces for the progressive transformation of our continent, which entirely healthy reality we also know from our own history. And to conclude as my eighth proposal, I'd like to appeal to you always to remember 
that you have an obligation to take advantage of the opportunity you have as university students, and therefore Africa's nascent intelligentsia, to empower yourselves to become the quality intelligentsia that our continent needs by diligently applying yourselves to the exciting task of studying. And therefore that you have to act to ensure that as you inherit the future as leaders of the peoples of Africa, you will have done your best to help build a better continent. And that you should always honor the truth, to respect the great Anawash who are our mothers and fathers, and have the courage fiercely, fearlessly to stand up for what is right and just, ready to present reasoned arguments in this regard. That you should always be ready to question and challenge even what is conveyed to you by all and sundry as established truths, including what I've said to you today, acting both as young people and as students who have the opportunity to re rediscover anew all truths about the human and material worlds that we inhabit. And that you should never abuse the fact of your greater success, your greater access to knowledge, to position yourselves as a corrupt and parasitic segment of African society. The informative information presented in this video is motivational and is positively aimed at inspiring, educating and entertaining the viewers with the cutting edge of critical reasoning. If you enjoy the contents on the Black Radar YouTube channel, please consider subscribing to show your support.